Um, women do get quite restless. I mean, who's seen someone having a clantic fit? Have you witnessed anyone having a clantic fit in front of you? Yeah, you know, they, they get very restless, and they're a bit twitchy, they get restless. Um, I remember trying to give someone hydralazine, intravenous hydralazine, which she was very poorly, and we'd made that decision to do that. And she was sort of lying there, not feeling very well. She had help syndrome as well, she had a lot of pain. And she sort of suddenly woke up, and twitched, and sort of brushed me off. Very, very irritable. And then they start to fit. We talk about the heralded eclampsia, so you, you, know, you have pre-eclampsia. Most people think you get pre-eclampsia, then you get eclampsia. But you can get it the other way around. You can get unheralded eclampsia. If someone comes in fitting, and you're not quite sure whether it's eclampsia, you think it may be. Maybe, something, maybe just an epileptic fit. Um, again, from the best study, 85% of cases had been seen within a week by a healthcare professional. Just over half were fully heralded, if you like, by the onset of both new hypertension and proteinuria, so you know, classically had preeclampsia. 22% only had high blood pressure, 10% only had protein, and 10% um, were completely unheralded. And you do hear the most extraordinary stories. A lady came in about 18 months ago now. She was a, she was a Russian lady um, and had an Eastern European partner. They spoke very good English. And he said, yes, I, a couple of nights ago, she, um, it was about four in the morning, she sort of woke up. She, was, she woke me up because she was really fidgeting and I couldn't get her to stop. And she, she looked really odd. She had this really funny colour. Her lips went so, oh my goodness. And then, and then she stopped and rolled over. She sort of went back to sleep. She was really heavily asleep, so I'd have to do it. And then she woke up the next morning. She said she felt a bit sick. She had this kind of pain. So I rang the GP. And he said, it's probably a stomach bug. There's a lot of it going around. And she came in like 24 hours after that with you know, severe preeclampsia, the range of function. But uh, it, it is absolutely amazing what people will tell you. The principles of treating eclampsia are are controlling the fit, although the vast majority are self-limiting, and if someone goes on fitting and you think that maybe something else is going on, um, you need to stop them refitting. There is extremely good evidence um, from very well-conducted randomized controlled trials to show that magnesium is the anticonvulsant of, cho of choice and re reduces the refit rate um, significantly more than other anticonvulsants like phenytoin and diazepam. You need to control the blood pressure um, intravenously, either with hydralazine or labetalol, there isn't a lot to choose between the two and different units use different, um, different medicines with the personal choice. If it's an antenatal fit, you need to think about delivering the fetus, but not before you've done steps one and two. Don't want to start giving general anaesthetics to someone with uncontrolled blood pressure because as soon as you start intubating them, you will put their blood pressure up even further. Um, so we go back to preeclampsia again. The classical, what we expect is people get blood pressure that creeps up and then they get proteinuria. But it's certainly true that you can get it the other way around. Let me show you an example. This was a normal, <coughs> low-risk primate. Books comes in 16 weeks, gets seen regularly, gets a urine dipstick regularly. We hope um, appropriately. Comes in at 38 weeks, two pluses of protein. Look at the weight gain here. 10 kilos in six weeks. That's quite hard to do, whatever you eat. However high the GI is, that's difficult to do. Okay. Um, came in at 38 and a half weeks with epigastric pain and four pluses of protein. When she came in, she <coughs> came in and was delivered by a caesarean section. Her urate levels at that time, urate, as you know, that uh, as a ballpark in our hospital anyway, it's about ten times the gestation in weeks. So at 38 weeks, urate, that urate's not. It's about normal. Plate still within the normal range. ASC of 54. That's that's abnormal. 
um, at both AST and ALT drift downwards, the normal range drifts downwards in pregnancy so that by the third trimester really anything over about 30, 35 is considered abnormal. So 54 is certainly abnormal. She had a normal sized little girl at 11 o'clock at night. Overnight her AST continued to increase, her platelets continued to drift down and she had an eclamptic fit at 4 in the morning. Urate goes up, as it tends to, platelets continue to fall, AST continues to go up. A day after delivery, by 6 o'clock in the evening, she was in coma. She had an abnormal cerebral MRI. She made a spontaneous recovery. And what happened again, typically the AST comes down while the platelets are still falling. But when the AST starts to fall, you can start to just relax a little bit, just like when they have their diuresis, you can start to relax just a little bit. Um, and by nine, ten days after delivery, it's coming back to normal. We often see a kind of rebound phenomenon here with these platelets, in that if someone's had very, very low platelets, they will actually go into six, seven, eight hundred. Um, if they go over 500 and, and get worried, we tend to put them on low-dose aspirin because we're worried about them having you know, being um, thrombocythemic. She was discharged home at 10 days. Just a word about new proteinuria. Certainly, above her, uh, Professor Redmond's new proteinuria is very rarely <coughs> caused by urinary tract infection. How many times have you seen antenatal notes? Protein 1 plus MSU tick. And that's the only thing that's done. That's what happens, isn't it? MSU tick. Well done, me. Great. Okay. 144 consecutive samples. Um, one of the SHOs did an audit project a year or two ago. 144 consecutive 1 plus of protein, not one urinary tract infection. Okay. So. It may be a manifestation of preeclampsia. We used to rely on 24 hour collections all the time, um, but they do have a slow turnover. We are relying more on protein creatinine ratios. You'll have a talk this afternoon and uh, find out whether that's okay to do or not. <coughs> Talking about the specific problem of early onset preeclampsia, which is the thing that we we worry about the most. We worry much less about people coming in at 39 or 40 weeks um, with their preeclampsia. Um, going back to the BEST study, what's interesting here is that we said 44% of fits occur postnatally. These white ones are the ones that occur, occur postnatally. Much more common in those with term preeclampsia. If you go to the earlier gestations, it's much more common to have antipartum eclampsia. When we look at the fetal outcome of these pregnancies, look at the instance of IUGR, defined in this case as less than the 10th centile, so you would expect in a normal population to have 10% of your babies less than the 10th centile, that's you know, what it is. If you look at the term babies, an instance of 11%, which is more or less what you would expect, okay, um, and a pretty low perinatal mortality rate. 32 to 36 weeks, much higher incidence of IAGR, and less than 31 weeks, it's even higher. Okay? Fetal growth restriction is a feature of preterm preeclampsia, and we as maternal medicine and fetal medicine specialists, those of us who spend time doing a lot of scanning, spend a lot of time um, with intense surveillance of these small babies. We use computerized antenatal CTGs looking, concentrating.